seasons in life. Now, I'm going to brag on my wife and, and totally embarrass her this morning. She hates it when I do this, so I'm going to keep it short so I can still have my own marriage, okay? Um, but my wife is, is awesome. Uh, she's a very godly uh, lady. I know that uh, like Craig Rochelle at Life Church, a lot of times he'll get up and tell you how hot his wife is. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll focus on her other attributes. Um, but, but my wife and I have a very special uh, relationship, a, a really solid marriage. And I'm not saying we haven't had our, our you know, disagreements here or there, but, but this, this idea of we can work it out. With God, all things are possible. We can work it out. There's hope for every marriage. There's hope for every person that will surrender their life and their heart to Jesus Christ. And so I just want to begin with that this morning. I'm not preaching from a place from a perfect marriage, but I'm preaching from a place of a really good one. And I hope that that is an encouragement to you. Uh, and, and part of that is, is just the greatness of God and the grace of God being lived out in my life and Amy's life at, at the same time. But as we look at God's design for marriage, we, we need to start with the scripture. But I want to begin this morning, as we have all year, just to pray for God to speak to us and expect that this morning. So if you would, bow your heads for just a minute, close your eyes, and just pray that simple little prayer, Lord, today, speak to me. And believing that, all God's people said, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, Genesis chapter 2. You can follow along in the app, in the Oakwood app. It has a place there for sermon notes. It has all the scriptures, all the bullet points, um, everything we're going to be talking about that's going to be on the screens today. You can follow along there. But we highly encourage that. Um, if not, uh, if you brought your Bible, turn it to Genesis 2. If you did not bring your Bible, we got you covered, okay? Grab that Bible that's right there in front of you. And uh, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and chapter 2 is the second chapter. So I, I'm, I'm not even going to put a page number in for it today. Just turn uh, to the beginning front of your Bible, Genesis. When you get there to 1-1, one, one, go over to uh, chapter 2. And let me just kind of lay what's been going out here in the whole first chapter of the Bible. It says in Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and he is a creative God, and he's been creating the earth, and he's been, been creating all of nature. He's been creating the animals and the birds in the air and the fish of the sea. And as he's been going through this, he keeps creating, and at the end of that day, he'll say, it is good, it is good, it is good. He creates some more, and it's, it is good, and the next day, it is good. And, and uh, then you get down to uh, the sixth day of creation as he's ending it there, and it's in verse 31, I believe, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. If you just jump to that, it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And so it's been good, 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 good. It's been very good. We get here to chapter 2, and it says, And on the seventh day, the Lord rested. He'd been working for six days. He establishes a Sabbath on that seventh day. He's going he's to take, take a rest. And then we get into this part where he is uh, concerned about man. He's concerned about Adam. And let's, let's pick up our, our passage here. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. It says this, And then the Lord God said, It is not good. And he's just been saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then at the end, it's very good. And now he says, oh, wait, now something's not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I will make him a helper fit for him. One that will be in likeness and pattern of him, but one who is actually fit for him. Now, I know it's Family Sunday, so I'm not going to get deep into this, but if you dig deep into the Hebrew and you get into the original meaning of the text, and I've read Bible scholars and lots of commentaries and thoughts on this, it's actually a physical thing too. And it makes sense biologically for those of us that can understand that, that the suitable helper for man was fit for man. And so there's, there's a context there of an emotional connection, of a relational connection, and of a physical connection right there at the very beginning in verse 18. Now look at verse 19. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name, giraffe. That was its name. I don't know how he came up with that, but... The man gave him to all livestock, to the birds in the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper, there's that word again, fit for him. There wasn't one like him. There wasn't one that he could relate to. And there wasn't one physically that was fit for him. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And brought her to the man. And then the man said this. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In other words, he's saying I can relate to her. 
She shall be called, whoa, man. Actually, just, yeah. I don't know what he said, actually, but I'm thinking if I saw a woman for the first time and I'd never seen one before, it might be, whoa, man. But so, so she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice the only creature in the world that wasn't from the dust of the ground. If you read the rest of that passage here, it talked about all these animals and creation being made out of the dust of the ground. The woman wasn't. She was actually made out of man, out of his rib. And then it says this, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, leave his original family, and hold fast to his wife. Will hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, one in thought, one in deed, one in body, one in mind, and one in spirit. And this oneness is what God intended marriage to be. And the problem is from the very beginning that what God designed to be, we've distorted we, we, we've kind of made it our own thing, our own way. Uh, sometimes the oneness isn't there. Uh, some, sometimes uh, uh, we go different directions. Sometimes we just twist the whole thing. And, and, and we have other, other uh, types of relationships that are trying to be normalized. But according to Scripture, and even from the very beginning here, we see that it was man and woman, a husband and a wife in holy matrimony, is what we say in marriage ceremonies, or in a holy marriage that God designed and it was good. First marriage ever. Adam and Eve. And you expect to read in chapter 3, right? The, right? the next chapter over. And Adam and Eve lived, what is it? Happily ever after. And they loved each other. They never had any issues. They never fought. They never had any disagreements. Their kids were perfect. They never hurt one another. And they never did anything wrong. Cain and Abel is what I'm talking about there. And, and hard, never had a hard day in their marriage, just loved each other all the time, completely agreed 100% of the time on every decision, even the picking of fruit at the grocery store or in the garden in their marriage. They, they completely came into agreement, and they never had any issues, and you're like, yeah, right. Not exactly. Look at the heading on chapter 3 in your Bible. What does it say? In mine it says, the fall. <laughs> The fall. It's like, hey, it is good, it is good, it is not good, they should be alone. So I'm going to create a suitable helper fit for man, and, and, and here's his, going to be his mate and the love of his life, and it's going to be great. And then we have the fall. Sin enters the picture, and then death enters the picture, and there's a lot of issues that enter the picture there. Now, we can make the argument sometimes that different people have different marriages. And I understand that. We're all, we're all different people. You know, you, you've heard of that before, the opposites attract sometimes the opposing personalities because they complement each other in strengths and weaknesses, have this tendency to come together. And so there are these times where there's marriages with different people, um, but sometimes those differences aren't celebrated or appreciated. Sometimes those differences, they, they become hardship in marriage. Because I know different marriages, different people, different situations, different personalities, different circumstances, sometimes different values. And it made me wonder, are there any universal problems that we could say all of us that maybe have encountered in marriage? Are there any universal problems that seem to affect marriages in a negative way that's just a universal principle that every marriage could say, ah, yes, yes, this. And as I was reading through Scripture and thinking about this, I thought of two, and I want to share those with you today. And hopefully it's something that we can all see and we can all understand. And even some of you that aren't married yet or, or are coming out of a hard uh, hardship and maybe you find yourself single again, or maybe you're just one of those people that are single and you have friends that are married, you're going to be able to see these things as well. Because these two things I'm going to talk about this morning really go hand in hand. And they are a universal problem and it, it related to sin that affects marriages and it's always in a negative way. The first one is this. The first one is this. There's a gap between expectations and reality. There's a gap between expectations and reality. Expectations are a very, very dangerous thing in life because if you would find yourself as saying I have felt disappointed most likely your disappointment is because your expectations were not met this relates to all matters of life maybe, maybe you were on some kind of a, a team sports team and you were practicing so hard and working so hard and then 
You didn't, you didn't reach the goal. You didn't make it to the regionals. You didn't, you didn't make it to the, to the championship game. And, and you had all these expectations, and you're super disappointed because none of those expectations came into reality. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's expectations at your, at your work. As you go to work, and, and maybe you've changed jobs recently, and the whole reason you changed jobs is because you thought this set of problems looks better than this set. And you get to your new job, and you're like, these are new people, and these are better people, and it's better circumstances, better pay, and better this, and better that. And then you get in those circumstances, and you're like, wow, it, all my expectations are not being met here. I really thought it was going to be a lot better. and It was just a little bit better, and actually now it's not even better at all. And it, it, it's kind of one of those things that I'm really struggling with. Sometimes we bring that into friendships, sometimes family relationships. We have these expectations that, that this, you know, when I go to the family reunion, you know, my, my, aunt, my, my aunt Gertrude is going to be really nice to me and talk to me, and we get there, and all she wants to do is talk to Cousin Ned, and oh, I got my feelings hurt. Why? Because you had expectations that she was going to give you all the attention. We bring all of these things into marriage. We bring all these things to marriage and all these expectations and what we deal with so many times and what most couples deal with is this, this time of, I call it disenchantment within the first two or three years of marriage. And it's a time where you go, wait a minute, all my expectations are not being met here. And there is this valley that's between, I have a graphic here that kind of shows us this, that we have, we have our expectations and then we have the reality in our marriage and then there's this gap in between. I would call that the valley of discontentment, okay, or the valley of great sadness. And, and honestly, and not, not being joking at all, it's a valley of darkness sometimes for some couples. Because they went into this relationship and into this marriage with these expectations that it was always going to be like it was when we were dating. And let me talk about dating for just a second. I think dating is totally non-preparatory for marriage. Because in dating, um, you always look good and smell good, and you, you have manners that you never had before, and you're always putting on your best. Why? Because you're trying to win them over, okay? And then it seems like we get into these marriage relationships, and the expectations are they're always going to look good, they're always going to smell good, you know, they're all, it's going to be like we were dating the whole, our whole life, and then we get to the reality of marriage, which is as a human, they have flaws, maybe, maybe even have some issues, and it's important that we look at these things as we're going into our marriages and understand that one of the universal problems in marriages is there's this gap between expectations and reality. Now, I want us to all admit this this morning, okay? Just admit this. My expectations that I bring into the marriage are normally centered on me. Right? That's why they're called my expectations, <laughs> is you bring expectations in, into the marriage and you realize right away, this is all about me. It's about me and, and that this house would be run the way I want it to be run and we would raise these children the way I want to raise these children and all of my needs that I have, you will fulfill them and I have all these expectations. You know, I, uh, one of the things I, I've gotten to do through the years and, and so many times is to do a premarital counseling. Um, by the time the uh, pastors and, and ministers get to do premarital counseling, I always feel like, um, as I've done this through the years, I, I've just grown to think it's almost too late. Because the time that they come to us and they want some counseling and they want to actually think about their marriage relationship and think about what it's going to be like uh, to make a commitment and a covenant to someone for a lifetime, um, they actually get there and they've already got a ring, they've got a date, uh, they, you know, they've sent out the invitations, they're like, um, please help us make this work. <laughs> And that's really the point is where we'd really like to start back maybe even before engagement, which is sometimes turns into enragement. But um, we, we just like to start before that. I'd almost like to do some pre-premarital counseling with couples to get them to think through, are you really unselfish enough and ready for a relationship that isn't all about you and your expectations and getting all of your needs met? And so we take them through some exercises. I just want to share a couple of these with you today. Uh, the first one we take them through, I do this workbook. It's called Before You Say I Do. And, and one of the exercises we take them through is called the Role Concepts Comparison Chart. The Role Concepts. So what is your role in the marriage as a wife? What is your role in the marriage as a husband? And the way they do this is they, get, they each have their own workbook. And, and on one column over here it says wife. And on the other one it says husband. And it says that what do you believe about your role in marriage? You circle one. Now if you circle the number one, it means that you strongly agree. If you circle number two, it means you mildly agree. If you circle the number three, that means not sure. 
And I don't know why they put these on these surveys because it's not helpful at all. Uh, Number four is mildly disagree. Number five is strongly disagree. Okay, and so we have a we have a girl and we have a guy and. They're wanting to get married, and they may even have an engagement date and invitation sent out. And we get into questions and like this. So these are some statements, and they have to rate them, whether they strongly agree, strongly disagree, mildly agree, mildly disagree. Here's one. The husband is the head of the household. Sometimes there's some different thoughts on that with couples. The second one, the wife should not be employed outside of the home. Hmm. What about this one? The husband should help regularly with household chores. So, Amen. Some, some guys are like, I didn't sign up for that. And some ladies are like, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Here's another one. Neither the husband nor the wife should purchase an item costing more than $100 without first consulting the other. Hard to get alignment on that with couples sometimes. Some of them strongly agree, some of them strongly disagree. It's my money. The father is the one responsible for disciplining the children. Well, not the wife, just the, the father because you know, he's there all the time. It is the wife's responsibility to keep the house neat and tidy. What about this one? The husband should take his wife out somewhere twice a month. Expectation, right? It is the husband's job to do all of the yard work. What about this? The mother should be the one who teaches the values to the children. How about this one? Children develop better in a home with parents who are strict disciplinarians. Get a lot of different answers on this. The money that the wife earns is her money. It doesn't go into the kitty that they share. And you see, you go through all of these um, roles and comparisons in marriage. It's really interesting because these couples that love each other, and then, oh, they got sparkles in their eyes, and when they kiss, little fireworks go out their ears, and... I mean, they are loving each other, and it's going to be great. We're going to get married, and we already got a venue. We got a venue, you know, we're going to have. I got a proposal picture video thing. It's 900 minutes on Facebook, and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. And you get into this, and you go, whoa, wait a minute here. Now, and we're not trying, I mean, I promise you, as pastors and ministers, we're not trying to uh, stir up anything for anyone. We're just trying to give you what? A reality check, because we have our expectations, but on the other side of that big, dark valley, that gap, is the reality of marriage. And some of these things, I think, ought to be considered before. So after we are done with that exercise, there's another exercise in the Before You Said I Do book, and it's on decision-making. How will you make decisions in the marriage? And so in this exercise, they give a rating, and it has to equal 100%. And so they can do 50-50, that the wife gets 50% of this, uh, this decision and the husband gets 50. Or there might be something where, well, the husband should have 80% of that decision and the wife should only have 20. And so separately from each other, they fill this out. Listen to some of these things. Choice of a new car. Very interesting. You think, well, that's, you know, yeah. And, and it's funny because most ladies put 90-10. 90% her choice, 10% his. Most guys put 80% his choice, 20% hers. Now, that is already a problem, right? Because who's picking the car, right? And see, here's the difference is the ladies are thinking what? It's got to smell good. It's got to have a certain color. It's gotta, I want this feature with the mirror that I can see the kids in the back seat in a few years. And I, you know, I, I really want it to be this, and I want it to have this. And what are the guys looking at? Oh, how much mileage is and you know, is, is how much warranty is on it and those tires, how long those tires are going to last. And, you know, they're looking at something. They're looking under the hood, and the women are just looking at the color. It's like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do maroon. I just can't. It's not my thing. And, and it's, these differences come up, but you, you see that there's a problem. Look at some of these other ones. The choice of the home that you should buy. Who gets, you know, well, Mama, Mama has some strong opinions, you know, on that. Uh, another question come down here is, uh, who gets to choose the decor for the home? I mean, you wouldn't want me decorating my home. It'd be real simple. <laughs> my wife has it looking really nice, so maybe she should have some more, some more uh, percentage of vote there. What, what about something like uh, this? What about the choice of entertainment? What about the choice of mutual friends for the couple? What about the choice of church? Where are we going to worship? What about the choice of the home menu and what is to be cooked and what type of food we'll cook and what type of meals? What about the choice of the number of children? Who gets the bigger vote there? Choice of where to live. 
choice of determining how the money is spent. And the list goes on and on. And we give these, these um, surveys and these questions out in this reality because we want couples to be prepared for that moment when they realize my expectations and the reality, there is this void there. There's this gap. And we're going to have to work something out with this. And God has an answer. God has an answer. It's in Scripture. And it's called mutual submission. Mutual submission. Mutual submission is God's solution to fill in the gaps between marriage expectations and reality. And it's all in how you view it and how you do it, how you treat each other. I want you to turn to another passage in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 21 here. And this is giving, uh, uh, this is um, some marriage um, c- commands for wives and husbands, which, but it relates all back to Christ and the church. Because Christ is the head of the church, and the church is the bride of Christ, it says in Scripture. And so there's a lot of parody here. But Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to begin there with verse 21. If you're using one of our Bibles, turn it to page 978. 978, and you'll be right there at Ephesians chapter 5. But beginning with verse 21, it says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So if you love Jesus, we want you to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he gets specific He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Just like you submit yourself under the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ, you're going to submit yourself in your home and in your marriage relationship under the headship of your husband. And then it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Just as Jesus is the Savior over the body. Now, this goes back, this concept actually goes back to something we read in Genesis chapter 2. Because in Genesis chapter 3, when the fall happened, and and Eve ate the fruit, and you know, the the snake was there, um, the serpent, uh, Satan was there, tempted, uh, she takes the fruit, she gives it to Adam, they eat the fruit together. When, When God is walking in the garden later in that chapter, and he says, hey, where are y all? You've never hidden from me before, why are you hiding now? And, and finally he finds them, and, and, and Adam speaks up and says, you know, we were fearful because we're naked, so he hid. And he says, well, who told you you're naked? And he said, did you eat the fruit off that one tree, the one rule I gave you to keep? Did you sin against me? Did you, did you eat of that fruit? And through that whole process there of God um, talking about them and their failure to live out his commands, he deals with Adam. Why? Because Adam was first. Why? Because Adam is the head Because Adam is the one that is supposed to be the leader. Adam's the one that's supposed to be in charge over his wife. And it's interesting because even right there in that chapter, you talk about marriage problems right away. He's like, the woman you gave me, she did it, right? And the woman's like, wait a minute here. I thought you were the first one here. You should have more knowledge and you should be caring about me. And this is all of these concepts, exactly what it's talking about here in Ephesians Ephesians chapter 5. When it says, wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And so the wives, we learn that. And then it goes to husbands now. Address this husbands in verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We just read that, right? Genesis 2.24. We just read that earlier. And this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love and respect, the give and take of mutual submission in a marriage. And this is one of those things, again, that I I think that we struggle with because we are struggling with these expectations on one side and this reality on the other. But yet God weaves this thing together beautifully in his plan. And he reveals it to us in in a very tangible way here in Ephesians chapter 5. Because here's the beauty of it. Here's how it works. 
Think about this, wives. If your husband loved you so much that he put you first and had your best in mind, and he put you first and highest and most and best in all decisions of his life and everything that your family is going to do for the future, if he loved you and he always served you and, and was just a servant leader in your home, do you think you'd have a hard time submitting to a man like that? I've never met a woman that said, oh, man, I hate that kind of guy. Now let's reverse a little bit. Let's, let's change this. If the wives would submit to their husbands and respect their husbands, men in the room, don't you think it's a lot easier to love a woman like that than the one that's like a drippy faucet that's always nagging? It's like, do, 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 do. It's always maybe trying to take control in the marriage. It's always like, well, I'm the head of the marriage. And, you know. But no, one that is submissive. But do you see it's a two-way street? That men, if you love your wife as Christ loved the church and you gave himself up for her, it's talking about Jesus Christ being a sacrifice for the church, his bride, that's all of us, then men, you should sacrifice in that same way for your wife, and that's showing her love like she's never experienced before. And then, for wives, that you would be submissive to your husband, that you would show him respect that you would not degrade him as a man, you would encourage him as a man, even stand by him in the mistakes of life. That he doesn't have a hard time loving that type of woman. And you see there's this balance there between love and respect. There's this balance there God's created in marriage. And that's the beauty of it, is he created it to work. Now I'm going to give you a second thing that I think is a universal problem in marriage, but I want you to understand how it really goes with the first. So the first is the gap between expectations and reality. The second universal problem in marriages is selfishness. Selfishness. Now this plays out not only in marriages, this plays out in all types of relationships. Dating relationships, middle school relationships, high school, college uh, even 20-year-old relationships and maybe you're dating someone, courting someone. This plays out a lot because there are two people and all it takes is about one of them to get selfish real fast and everything goes south. And selfishness in marriage almost never works out. I'm not going to say it never works out, but I'd say almost never. And there seems to always be issues and problems there. And here's, here's the fact this morning. God designed marriage to be focused on we more than me. God designed marriage to be focused on we more than me. But the problem with selfishness is selfishness is always looking out for yourself. It's always looking out for number one. I don't go in to, to this evening and think, what can I do to bless and serve my wife? No, it's I'm tired, I'm beat, what, what, can, what, can, she, what can she do for me? You know, you know, make dinner tonight? Oh, I'm going to have to fix my own dinner. I'm going to have to get some out of the freezer again. Oh, I got this, I got that. And you see, selfishness automatically bristles everyone involved. And it's one of the ugliest things I've seen. If I, if I could say one thing about um, helping couples with marriage situations all throughout my years, usually somebody, or honestly, some buddies, got selfish. And they started worrying about themselves more than about their spouse. And they quit serving them, and they quit loving them, and they quit showing them affection, and they quit showing them the, the love of Christ. And none of that was lived out in that relationship. And it got to this point where it got really ugly. Because somebody got selfish. It's a universal problem. We're born with this sin nature as children. I mean, what, the first time your kid that, that's like one and a half tells you no, it's like the first word that every child knows, right? Is no. You know, it's like, you know, little Johnny come over here and he says no. Why? Because he's selfish. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to do what he wants to do. It's all about him. And so we fight this sinful tendency our whole life. And the only way to overcome it is through the grace of Jesus Christ through the forgiveness that comes through the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you want hope for your marriage, it's only found in him because he's the designer of it. But when he designed it, he designed it to be a we thing and not a me thing. Let's be honest this morning and say this, that some of our marriages, they were not built on the things that God intended. They're built on how good someone looked or how good someone made someone else feel. 
And that was enough to charge us and to change us, sometimes to even talk us into situations and circumstances where we were, we were going and heading into moral failure. We put our convictions of how we're supposed to do this thing to the side and we decided, hey, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna live together, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And we allowed that sinfulness and that selfishness inside of our relationships. And let's be honest, for some of you, nearly ruined you. For some of you, you may say, you know what? I'm still looking wounds from a relationship that was not sanctified or blessed by God because I chose to do it my way, the selfish way. And for some reason, it just didn't work out the way that I thought that it would. And yet God calls to us this morning, he says, I wanna change you and I wanna change you from the inside out. And I'm in the business of restoring broken things and broken marriages and we, God, you and me, we can work it out. As we close this morning, I wanna just share a scripture and I wanna just let this scripture speak to you this morning. It's from uh, Philippians chapter two and all of the, all of the uh, words are gonna be on the screen so you can just read it and follow along. But I want you to let this soak in this morning. I want you to receive this from the Lord. I want you to examine this. I want you to apply this to relationships in your life. I want you to apply this, all of, all of you who are married this morning, apply this to your marriage and think about this and let God speak to you and maybe change your heart through, through his word this morning. Philippians chapter two, beginning with verse three. It says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And you need to have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But no, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, yes, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And then he gives us this example of Jesus, who's God in the heavens and has all power and all authority. He declares it in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me, Jesus says. And yet he comes to earth and takes on the form of man, completely humbling himself and taking on the form of a servant. And that's what we need to do in our marriages. That's what we need to do in our relationships. Because it's not, it's not about me. It's about we. If you're here this morning and you, you feel like, man, I have been a selfish person. Some, some of you guys, man, we have this tendency to be so selfish. It's all about me and what I want and my schedule. Some of you wives, maybe you've struggled with that. You, you, you have not been there uh, for your husband when he's needed you. Maybe you're the one that has been pulling away and, and, and being selfish and getting focused on other things in the world that are distracting you from that relationship. But I wanna encourage you this morning. All of those things can be overcome through the blood of Jesus Christ. All of those things can become because of what Christ did for us. If you're struggling with your own selfish ways, your own selfish desires today, I wanna to tell you, this is a good day for you because there's forgiveness offered for you through the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we are, it seems by nature, a very selfish people. 